I have a, a question for Haroon and, and a comment for Carlos. So, Haroon, you, you, you seem to pay a lot of a emphasis on the top part of the distribution on public sector unions pulling wages up, as I understood it. Um, can you sort of make some more comments of that vis-a-vis -vis the technical change component? So if, if you took away public sector, let me rephrase, if you took away public sector workers from your data and you only showed private sector behavior as reflecting technical change and all that, would you think that you have the same pattern or is it mostly the public sector union part? And that's sort of relevant to try to get a little bit to Kunal's point. And then on, on Carlos, I don't know whether you can speculate a little bit on the following. So on your data, you have countries in which the minimum wage was raised very aggressively in the period you were looking at, Brazil particularly and others, and countries in which the minimum wage was not raised at all. Um, Mexico was the one in which that didn't happen. Uh, but you have the falling returns to education, the relative returns in both. So, can you sort of, why was it in Mexico where the minimum wage didn't go up that a behavior similar as you've seen in other countries in which you could explain part of the wage compression through a minimum wage going up? Seems like there was a further falling in returns in Mexico in the upper part of the skilled people. So, yeah. two questions. Do you want to start? Um, thanks, Santiago. Um, so, the the explanation we have, and I'll deal with the difference between the public and the private sector, but this is the way we like to think about the public sector union stories, that they've been in, in bargaining, in other work that we've done, um, they have aggressively pursued bringing the bottom up, right? So in other words, uh, strong, so there's an increase in the floor. So the minimum wage in the public sector has gone up, mimicking the other sectoral minimum wages. Um, and uh, have, have also sought out, but the public sector has responded because there's a scarce skill effect, right, with large increases for the top end. And the state then is forced to manage the, the wage bill, which they effectively do by hollowing out the middle. And that's, you see that for teachers, you see that for uh, 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 firemen and women and so on. But if you abstract from that, and, and your question is, but is it a public sector effect? I think what definitely what's going on uh, and if you look at the, I won't, I won't uh, try and do the panel B graph again, but if you look at it carefully, and I've just double checked it, the, the 80th percentile and above coefficient effect is, uh, is positive for both public employment and the analytic tasks. And so I think what's going on is both stories, is this public sector union that's representing the elite and then a skills biased uh, technical change story that's talking about tasks, uh, and rewarding analytical tasks, and it's Kunal's point about structural change. So you've got this services-dominant economy that's driven by financial and business service, telecoms, and, and analytical jobs then get this high premium. So I think it's both effects, but what you're suggesting is a really interesting thing, is to rerun the whole thing, taking public sector workers out, and I think that's a great suggestion, actually. Carlos. Yes. Again, from the, from the Brazil-Mexico comparison, from the case studies for... Uh, for, for for what I remember, uh, Ferreira shows uh, with this RIF approach that both minimum wages and um, um, the education premium were important for uh, the reduction on wage inequality in the bottom of distribution. The, the point of Mexico is certainly something that um, has been not done in this project, but w from what I, uh, we have seen is Mexico has an economic structure that is quite different to the rest of the Latin America in terms of the, their size of uh, the manufacturing sector, which by some means is almost equal to the total uh, uh, value of, 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 the, of the manufacturing sectors of, uh, of the rest of Latin America. Uh, some of the, I mean, in this, this paper of Gordon Hanson of why Mexico is not rich, he makes the points of uh, Mexico producing what China also produces rather than what China consumes. And in that sense, uh, Mexico didn't benefit uh, in terms of the wage, uh, uh, the distribution of wages and earnings from this commodity boom. And what happened in terms of your question of uh, what happened in the, in the top of the earnings distribution, some of the hypothesis is also because this last period is conf uh, confounded with the effects of the global financial crisis is that some of those 
uh, jobs for high skill actually were um, uh, were destructed, and 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 some people have to go into lower, uh, high skill uh, workers have to go into lower productivity jobs uh, as a sort of um, an, an adjustment. And and the other really uh, has to do with some sort of skills mismatch because the some of the literature on, on education in Mexico shows that even though there has been a higher years of education with respect to the past in terms of the, 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 the total amount of uh, 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 education that the workforce has. Uh, I mean, uh, there is some evidence also that the firms that are coming to Mexico are not finding the specific skills they need. So there is an issue also with the education uh, system in terms of providing the skills that the, world, uh, the job market needs. Plus, we know there is a lot of uh, important issues in terms of uh, factor misallocation that really uh, doesn't uh, uh, match the higher skill with the higher productivity jobs and, and really creates that a lot of firms, uh, as shown by your work, it really stay as uh, small and, 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 and low productivity. But uh, th th I think that's, that's more or less what happens in the top of the institution. Yeah, uh, so Harun, a great paper and there's a lot to in it too, so I, I need to read it more to wrap my head around it. But two questions, you know, one in this RIF, I'm always confused with the interaction term, the you know the contribution of the interaction term, and in your several of those, it's sort of kind of flattish, so it's not very clear to me what that how that can be interpreted. That's always my confusion about the interaction term in RIF. But more uh, substantively, you. So the wage, so there's one wage distribution story, which is that the middle is being hollowed out. And then you've reclassified occupation by task types. And from your description, it seems like there are many kinds of, many tiers of occupation within a certain task. So domestic workers and teachers, et cetera, like all the on-site people, you know. But if you think of the wage distribution within this task type, it's not, it's not people at similar wage levels. So I'm not exactly sure how your task type distribution maps out to the wage distribution so nicely. I'm confused by that. Yeah, the interaction term could, I mean, it's, I think it gets dominated by the flat endowments effect, right? Which is close to zero and that probably picks up what you see as the interaction effect. It's a little bit like these interaction terms generally if if you get a lot of zeros, you're going to see a flat, right? And that's effectively what it's, what it's picking up. So you write that the, the tasks are distributed across occupations. And so effectively you're seeing, though, the returns to the task, right? And so what should happen, as with any multivariate story, is that if there's a dominant analytical component to the task, the returns will be to the task, right? So it's a slightly different way. So all the modeling that's done in this literature does that where, where the occupation gets replaced with a composite set of tasks, if you like. So all it's suggesting is that if your job, let's think of it this way, in the individual um, cell, right, where you have the individual, if your task is 80% analytical, right, on average you're seeing a higher return. I mean, that's, um, you know what I'm getting at, right? So in essence, that's the real innovation, I think, in the way that you think about task content jobs rather than pure occupations. Um, and, and it should come out in the wash, right? So in other words, if you see on average that analytical jobs, analytical tasks within occupations are seeing a declining return, then that's what the results will show. Uh, I just have a question for, for Harum. And it's related with my previous experience in a contribution with the Honduras, Honduras case where the, uh, the um, incidence uh, growth curves showing in, in Honduras uh, a de decline in the bottom part of the, the distribution. So my explanation for in, in, in that work was related to the inability of rural workers to move to modern sectors. Okay, and this is basically because of language, mm. so ethnicity, and probably very bad basic education. So they were not able to, to make uh, easy mathematical calculations. So now 
this is what I call uh, workers' heterogeneity. And, and I want to listen a little bit. You, uh, uh, what are your thoughts on heterogeneity in the South African context? Because my, what, what I, I, I can try to, to, to see in, in, in your graphs is that probably uh, workers in the middle of the distribution are not able to progress in occupations with rising pace, so with, high, with, with increasing uh, prices. Uh, and at the, on, at the bottom part of the distribution, it seems to be clear that they have to accept what is going on, and probably is there a demand-driven problem for the, for the middle part, so that they cannot shift to other occupations because unemployment is high, and they just are trapped in, this, in, the, in their occupation, that probably because of demand, lowers the, 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 the premium. Yeah, so I mean, I think you're right that there's all sorts of segmentation going on, right? That the middle of the distribution is, our, our sense is that it's a structural change story um, and it's a demand-driven one, right? Uh, and workers are heterogeneous and so that, that, that gives you the outcome that you see. The bottom end workers tend to be homogenous and so you would, in the, you would expect, a, I mean, what you would expect is maybe the Honduras case or a decline in earnings, right? So in other words, I would, have, I would have almost not been surprised if the bottom end also saw negative growth rates. Uh, and then the top end is where you see all the action because it's services, it's the structural change argument. But I think what it shows is you've got an exogenous shock. Um, and we... To, to be careful with the paper, because we don't have uh, minimum wages on the right-hand side, I don't show you any of the minimum wage data, but you've had very, very aggressive real wage increases for minimum wage workers. Um, and, 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 and I think that's, that exogenous shock plays itself out in, the, in, the, in that outcome that you see. I was looking at the, your paper, uh, that is Gary, uh, the increase in labor earnings, and I thought that perhaps we may need to interrogate it further and add on the story of job creation. Um, the increase in earnings, is it because of jobs that are highly paying that are being created or it's a matter of price setting that they're existing and, and then they are paid more? And then with Haron, I uh, was looking at the missing middle. What could be the policy implication? Because you tend to emphasize that uh, it's mainly an issue of uh, of payment, not so much of endowment. But could it be that uh, this middle class do not have the skills required in the job market that uh, perhaps as a policy implication that uh, it, it could be to do with the endowment as well? If the increase, in, I, I think, but I may be wrong, that the increase in labor earnings is caused not so much by wage setting institutions as by supply and demand in labor markets. Uh, Unemployment rates are fairly low, and uh, that, uh, that workers are being reallocated uh, as employers bid for them. But Carlos, you're the expert on Latin America. Do you, do you agree with that? Uh, it was mostly, I mean, from the, the evidence in other studies that were done, it's mostly because of a, a higher um, uh, returns to low skilled workers, particularly rural areas or associated to agricultural activities, uh, particularly in South America, that's a, a lot of the effect came to that price effect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but in answer to her question is that that's not because of unions uh, for, of farm workers or something. It's supply and demand? Yes, yeah, supply and demand and will be for, yeah. from this ex ex exogenous uh, sh shock uh, okay. presented you. as commodity yeah. boom. Yeah. Harun. Um, so just off the top of my head, three policy options. One is to improve the quality of uh, the schooling system specifically. A lot of the collapse in the middle of the distribution uh, is because employers don't trust the certification uh, either incomplete or complete in the high school system. Um, I think that is, that's one difference that may be true in the Latin American case, that there were massive improvements, in, I think, in the quality of the schooling system. So our, in the South African case, that, that would be one clear policy um, option. The second is the entire TVET system um, is dysfunctional. And the TVET system is the bedrock for the middle of the distribution workers. 
So the TVET system is the system that provides those semi-skilled workers. Um, and so even if we wanted to be a hub for light manufacturing in the region, we just don't have the, uh, the, the semi-skilled workforce to do that, and the, and the TVET sector is critical. And then the third is a lot of the middle of the distribution jobs come from um, innovative, well, no, can in the policy sense come from innovative, labor-friendly, if you like, industrial policy. South Africa's most, uh, uh, the, the biggest subsidy spent by industrial policy is on the motor industry, which is incredibly capital intensive, creates very few jobs. Uh, you can imagine if that was diverted to plastics, chemicals, other light manufacturing jobs, uh, there'd be a big kick for middle of the distribution jobs. 